says live. We're live, everybody. Just doing a little stretching here. Just getting ready. Oh, I don't know why I would have to stretch my head. But um, I really need to stretch my tongue, you know. Oh, Jessica's first one to say hello. Hello there, Jessica from Austin. Hello there, my friend. Nice to see you all. Great. Welcome, everybody. We're live. Yes, I say that because uh, that was from uh, Brent Musburger, I think. CBS Sports. You're looking live at Notre Dame Stadium. Something like that. That could be my intro. Oh, and John Garten, I did say hi to um, Monsignor Reed and Father Hank yesterday, so that was great. And they said, oh, he's great. We love him. So it would be awkward if they said we don't like him, but then I wouldn't report that to you. But instead, they said they like you, so that's good. Okay, so there's Mary and Elaine and everyone, so it's really great. Nice to have you all. I, I should stop announcing names, but, but I see you, and I, I look at them later, so I really appreciate all this, all of your, your comments and everything. And just being with you. Again, it's, it's really great to be with you. Um, okay, then. Uh, great. Uh, there's the grow mares. All right. Um, okay, stop it, Bill. I just, I see everybody. This kind of like that woman, remember, was it Romper Room? When she took like a little um, mirror or something, what was it? It freaked me out. But she would like look through this thing and she'd be like, and I see Julie, I see Megan, I see blah, blah. And one day she said she saw me and I ran behind the couch. It was really freaky. I don't think she could see us, but I didn't know that when I was little. Okay, so um, today is, uh, today is um, Sunday, the third Sunday of Easter. And uh, it's good to be with you. It was a beautiful, beautiful day here in uh, Pensacola and uh, really the, this whole area. So uh, I was outside today after Mass and um, uh, did a lot of yard work and everything and cut myself. I'm bleeding. Um, I, was, I actually cleaned the side of the house and the gutters. It was really neat. And um, I knew this would happen. God bless my neighbors. I think they're watching. I just got a big extension ladder. Um, with my stimulus check, if I get it, I wanted to buy something with it. I still haven't gotten the check, but I got a letter. And um, so uh, I knew that the, the neighbors would be holding their, uh, their breath because I was way up there on the ladder and everything and, and just w wiping down the house with a big sponge and palm olive. Palm olive does everything, I think, and so it worked. But I would do that, I would go up there, and then I would come down and uh, spray it off and everything. And so finally, here come the neighbors, and they're like, do you mind, can, can we just stand here and like hold the ladder for you or whatever? And I'm like, okay, fine. And then they were so great, they said, actually, we have an extension brush and, uh, and this special spray bottle stuff that's really good. So we did that, you know, and I did that. It was great, it was awesome. So the house is really nice. It looks nice too for the neighbors. But then on the side of the house, there's the um, electricity that comes in, the wire, and I am freaked out about electricity. I don't really understand it. I don't, I don't like it. So I'm not going to hold a big pole and stand on a metal ladder and work around that. So the side of the house is not really nice. But anyway, this is just more information than you wanted or needed. But that's what I did today. So it was nice to be outside. Okay, and then also... Yeah, well, yeah, then I also got to join another youth group in uh, Tallahassee, Good Shepherd, and that was really neat. I joined them for uh, just some, uh, some conversation, uh, some fun little games, and then uh, prayer was really neat, and just, just some uh, interesting uh, conversation with them, with about 45, 50 young people from Tallahassee. It's always exciting. Okay, that's enough. Oh, and yeah, that's enough. So we're moving on with the Bible. Remember, we talked first about, I gave an overview, quick overview of the Bible, and then I talked about um, the first five books, the Pentateuch, or the Torah, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. After that, I talked about the um, historical books. Well, yeah, the three in between those two, and that is um, Esther, no. Anyway, the three in Judith, and I'm already forgetting. See if I haven't written it down. Um, it's, it's gone. And then um, last time I talked about the prophetic books. Or, I'm sorry, the wisdom books, which is really neat. I, I like that. And now I want to talk about uh, the, um, the prophetic books. 
And I don't, I haven't written a lot on these, so it's kind of really brief. We're going to go through these pretty quickly. But it, but the, the notes that I found, especially in the New American Bible itself, are really interesting, I think, and they'll help us to understand, uh, you know, as a collection, what are the prophetic books? What are they, what are they and how, how, how do they instruct us? How do they point us to the Messiah, and how can they instruct us today? Okay. In the earliest prophets, it seems, um, we, see a, we see a little transition. The earliest prophets really spoke, prophesied about um, returning to the law, returning to the Lord, the tradition of the elders. Later prophets, just like later wisdom, kind of moved toward the coming of a Messiah and eternal life. There's a little more clarity, if you will, as time goes on, as time went on. Still, it has to be said, just like with wisdom, we had no idea what to expect. You know, they, our ancestors knew that God was going to send a savior, a Messiah, but they had no idea. They had no idea that it was going to be God. God's son would come to us personally. I mean, can you imagine explaining that to our ancestors? They thought probably that it was going to be a super prophet, you know, a uh, uh, King David, but even better than a King David. They just, there was no way that our ancestors even could conceive of the fact that God would come in the flesh, born of a virgin, and then God would give his life for us. Um, we have the privilege of knowing that now because we are on the other side of that, but our ancestors only dreamed about that. Jesus even said, blessed are your eyes, for they see what your ancestors only wanted to see. Your ears have heard things your ancestors never even conceived of. Okay. The prophets, we can't really see them as a unified whole. Um, some are records of specific prophets, some are not. Jonah is the story of the mission of a prophet, not really prophecies per se. Lamentations is not prophecy either. It is the mourning over Jerusalem by Jeremiah as a representative of the people of God. And Daniel, as we'll see, is more like apocalyptic literature than prophecy. The books show us, show the institution of the office of prophet, which was held by a succession of Israelites that were chosen and sent by God to give God's messages. They were spokesmen for God, intermediaries from the introduction of the prophetic books in the New American Bible. The communications they received from God came from, came through visions, dreams and ecstasies and were transmitted to the people through sermons, writings, and symbolic actions. Mostly the prophets called the people to renounce sin and idolatry, to maintain God's law and stay focused on God's promises. They consisted in warnings, threats, announcements of punishment, and promises of deliverance, sometimes all at once. Their prophecies came with solemnity and also with imaginative language. They were especially concerned with the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God, a Son of God, in the later years. So they urged people to be faithful to the covenant and wait for its fulfillment. Okay. It's not always clear what the timeline is for the prophets, when they prophesied, when the books were written, etc. Sometimes their predictions were for the near future, what was going to happen immediately, and other times it was for the far off, far off future. And sometimes, again, it must be said, it was both, both end. What might, what's going to happen very soon and what also will happen later on, what will be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. Okay, great. Again, from the introduction. The universal blessing for humankind, often promised by God through the mouths of his prophets in figures and types, was in time to become personalized and to confer its full benefit on us through the Word made flesh, who became for us the new covenant through his life, death, and resurrection, as the prophets foretold. Okay, we have four major prophets and twelve minor prophets. Now, if you've ever heard that term, major and minor, it doesn't mean that the four are the four major prophets are more important. It's just, uh, mostly it's because their books are a lot longer than the 12 minor prophets. So that was kind of an interesting thing when I learned that. I thought, yeah, well, that makes sense that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and 
Daniel would form the major prophets because it's pretty major what they said. But really it's mostly because their books are, are longer, if you will. And uh, okay, great. So the first one is Isaiah. As part of his call, Isaiah witnessed a vision of God's glory and immortality. And immensity, I mean. I, I don't know why I said immortality, but I guess that too. Isaiah had this vision of God, if you will, the divine in his being. This colored his prophecy in which he chided the people for their sinfulness and their selfish behavior. He was overwhelmed by the chasm between God's infinite goodness and the sin of humanity. Because he was called and purified, he was able to respond, Here I am. Send me. It is widely held that Isaiah prophesied in the 8th century before Christ, that he composed most of the book himself, and that his disciples, writing in his name, composed the remainder. Scholars call the last section, chapters 40 through 55, Deutero-Isaiah, and think that it was written by an anonymous poet who attached Isaiah's name to it. There was a lot of that, it seems, in the Bible. From these last chapters come the suffering servant songs, which are the prophecies of the coming Messiah. We can say that the prophecies refer to a king or the people of Israel as a whole, but it is clear that these find their perfection in Jesus Christ. I mean, how could we not believe that when Jesus himself quoted Isaiah extensively, especially in his first sermon in Nazareth where he grew up? He unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and said and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to send glad tidings to the poor, etc., etc. Rolled up the scroll and said, This day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That's Isaiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah portrays a nation in crisis. We see the rise of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar which would be the end of the Judean independence and the fall of Jerusalem. When Jeremiah was called, um, the house of Israel had already fallen, and he was in Judah, and he was called to speak to the house of Judah. Jeremiah knew it would not go well. He knew that they would, he would not be well received, and so, like all the prophets, he said, no, don't send me. In fact, I'm too, I'm too young. Don't send me. And God said, I choose you, and I make you worthy to go and speak to my people. God called Jeremiah at a young age to call the people back to faithfulness in the midst of a very dark time in history. Because people did not listen to him and persisted in their sins and following false prophets, the Babylonians captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Around this time, 587 BC, Jeremiah uttered the oracle of the New Testament, which is sometimes referred to as the gospel before the gospel, chapter 31, 31 through 34. It's the hallmark of Jeremiah's prophecies. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So there you go. I like that. The gospel before the gospel, Jeremiah, chapter 31. Ezekiel. Ezekiel is primarily interested in the temple, and worship. Like Jeremiah, Ezekiel was a priest, became a prophet in Babylon during the exile. He's the first prophet to receive a call outside of the Holy Land. He helped to prepare the people for the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, and eventually helped them to prepare for the restoration. Like Jeremiah, he saw a new covenant as coming in the future. As with Jeremiah, however, this new covenant would find fulfillment only in the New Testament. I think one of my favorite passages from the prophets is in Ezekiel, chapter, just poked my eye, by the way, chapter 36. You know it well. This is really neat. I like this a lot. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God. Okay, mm -hmm, I approve my holiness. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. 
I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes. You shall live in the land I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Ezekiel. Great stuff. Okay. And then the last of the major prophets is Daniel. And as I said, Daniel is, is it seems more, it's more like apocalyptic literature than it does prophecy. Daniel was written during the bitter persecution carried on by Antiochus IV Epiphanes. 167 to 164 BC. So just about 150, 160 years before the coming of Christ. To strengthen and comfort the Jewish people in their ordeal. The visions promise glory to come to the Jews one day. The kingdom of God will ultimately triumph. And we see this come in the person of Jesus who identifies himself with the Son of Man, described as a mysterious figure in Daniel. Then we have the 12 minor prophets, plus Lamentations and Baruch. Again, Lamentations is not really prophecy, but it's put in with the prophets. Lamentations is a series of laments um, uh, from basically written by uh, Jeremiah's secretary, uh, that is Baruch, um, and, and uh, some people put it together, Jeremiah and Lamentations, but anyway, it's, um, okay, and then there's Baruch. Um, the 12 minor prophets describe how the people's repentance led to their restoration after the exile. There is Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These were written and around the time of the others, 6th to 4th century BC, and it's more of the same what we hear in the major prophets. We find many elements that were fulfilled in Jesus from these minor prophets. The entry into Jerusalem, the proclamation of the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the precursor, John the Baptist, the day of the Lord, and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. Here's an interesting little tidbit that I found and liked. Malachi chapter 3, verses 24, is the last verse in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament. And it ended, it used to end, please hold, you're doing great. It ended very kind of negatively. Here is uh, chapter 3, verses 24. To turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with doom. So that was the last verse of the Old Testament, lest I come and strike the land with doom. And I think, um, it's, where did I, I wrote this down? Sometime in history, scribes added a repetition of an earlier verse so that the collection of the prophets would not end in doom. So they repeated the 23rd verse for verse at right at the end of 24, which is, Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and terrible day. Much better, a much better ending to the Old Testament than, lest I come and strike the land with doom. So that's just kind of an interesting thing. Okay, great. And that's pretty much where we, we now we come to the end of the Old Testament or, or the Hebrew scriptures. We've learned about the origin of the Hebrew people the call of God to be his special possession, his special people, the giving of the law, the exhortation to be faithful and to return to the Lord, prophecies of the day of the Lord and the new covenant. The stage is set for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Everything points to him. Next time we'll talk about the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. All right. But I hope you have a great week and um, uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, also, here's another thing. It, it, you have a lot of homework now if you want to read the prophets. Um, but another great thing to do today would be to read today's gospel that we heard at Mass that we, we had proclaimed. And that is um, the gospel, the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. I talked about this during the octave of Easter one of these evenings. But um, it's really, really neat. I, I, today I found myself reflecting at Mass on how 
they made the transition right there in front with Jesus from seeing him in the flesh, the resurrected flesh, and realizing that they have him always in word and sacrament. And so while they wanted to have him there always in the flesh, they knew that even when he was taken up into heaven, he would still be with them and is still with us in word and sacrament. Okay. Uh, also in the scriptures, I know people, uh, have, uh, several people have asked if we could, um, if I could talk a little bit more about Mary, our mother, maybe even pray a rosary sometime. I'd like to do that after, or while we go through the Bible, one of these nights. I still want to get my brother on here, and also um, Archbishop Gomez, who is kind of the, the president of the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. He is inviting all of us on May 1st to, together, to reconsecrate this country to Mary, our mother. And so look for that. That will happen. I don't know when the first is. It's in a couple of days, maybe five days or something. So it's, it'll happen this week. And you'll, you'll see information on our diocesan webpage uh, about that. Okay. All right. Great. Well, God bless you. I hope all is well. And I hope you stay safe. May God bless you and keep you safe tonight and always. And let's end with it. Oh, somebody asked um, if we could pray the uh, Memorari in my family after we finished the rosary, we would always pray the Memorari. I was told it's my mom's favorite prayer, so that's why that was added. And then we'd pray the prayer of St. Francis because that's my father's favorite prayer. So we prayed those two prayers after the rosary. Let's pray the Memorari. Remember, O oh most blessed Virgin Mary. Wait, now, now I'm nervous. Remember, Mother Mary. Oh my gosh. I can't believe, uh, this is really embarrassing, it's live. I looked right there and I was reading something. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Gosh, when I'm on the spot like that, I forget. People do that with... Um, with confessions, you know, they come in and I say, okay, would you like to say your act of confu uh, confusion? <laughs> act of uh, contrition. And they, they, people are like, oh my God, I, oh. and they apologize to me. They're like, this is horrible, let me start over. And they can't do it and I say, no, this happens to me all the time. Are you sorry for your sins? Just express that and everything will be okay. By the way, one more thing. I was, um, I can't talk about confessions, of course, would never do that, but I do remember just in a class talking about this with little little ones, and a little little boy was practicing his act of contrition. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for it. They always say heartily sorry, it's heartily sorry. And then he said, I firmly intend with the help of your grace to sin no more. And he stopped and he said, whoa, that's a lie right there. <laughs> it was pretty neat. He said, that was a lie because you can't say I'll sin no more. He said, I'm, I'm gonna sin. I'm like, no, yeah, but you don't want to. You firmly intend never to sin again, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay, good. Go with that. Sorry, that's all. Okay, you, you've got stuff to do. I don't want to waste your time. May Almighty God bless you tonight and always and your families and your loved ones, our country, indeed, our whole world. May God hold us all in the palm of his hand and shower us with his love, grace, and mercy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you. Bye.